Hello, true crime fanatics. My name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for diving back into the abyss with us today. We know we haven't been here for a while. We've taken our little hiatus. We are back, though. We are ready. And we are going to bring you some great episodes that we are very excited about. Today, we're going to be talking about Picking Cotton by Jennifer Thompson Canino and Ronald Cotton. And we are really excited to talk to you about this. This was such a good book. If you didn't read this book with us you definitely should it's up there with like the ice man for me and I don't read nonfiction books that much so really enjoyable excited to talk about it if you like our episodes go ahead and give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube go ahead and subscribe hit the notification bell give us the five star rating on Apple Podcasts if you're there Spotify there's not much you can do except download it we love it and if you want to go a little bit further we have a Patreon that you can donate to to help us kind of produce the show and get things out to you and you can do that on our website we get a little bit right now we are very appreciative we love you guys and we love the support that you're able to give us also coming over a little bit of a cold right now so if we sound a little weird particularly me more than Brittany (laughs) then that's why and um hopefully it won't get in the way (laughs) so since we did take this little hiatus just to keep you up to date this Monday will be the next new episode coming out that's not a book club episode talking about a case so we're excited to get back on the roll with that with you guys so if you didn't read the book or just need a little refresher I'm going to read the synopsis for you Jennifer Thompson was raped at knife point by a man who broke into her apartment while she slept. She was able to escape and eventually positively identified Ronald Cotton as her attacker. Ronald insisted that she was mistaken, but Jennifer's positive identification was the compelling evidence that put him behind bars. After 11 years, Ronald was allowed to take a DNA test that proved his innocence. He was released after serving more than a decade in prison for a crime he never committed. Two years later, Jennifer and Ronald met face-to-face and forged an unlikely friendship that changed both of their lives. With Picking Cotton, Jennifer and Ronald tell, in their own words, the harrowing detail of their tragedy and challenge our ideas of memory and judgment while demonstrating the profound nature of human grace and the healing power of forgiveness. So to kick off the story, it happened in Gibson, North Carolina, which is pretty cool because... Brittany and I both are familiar with North Carolina territory and I just loved personally that the book started out with the positive outcome that happens you know where it was like Ronald and Jennifer at the park together so you're really hopeful throughout the book you knew that it was going to be a good outcome at the end so it kind of gives you something to look forward to yeah that's really nice especially if you don't know anything about their case because it shows you that it's going to be like a good story a happy story even though there's a lot of trials and tribulations through it it's going to end up in a good place yeah I didn't um notice if you haven't read the book you know trigger warning the beginning is pretty graphic when Jennifer is explaining what she went through and um how the guy was stalking her and even though it was graphic I thought sometimes you hear these graphic stories and you're like that those details weren't necessary you know sometimes they over detail things usually in fiction they're like over detail stuff but here I thought it was very important because it kind of supported the idea that she really knew his face she was looking at him she was talking to him she you know was interacting with him and it just showed that she really knew what was going on so it made her testimony about who she thought it was seem more realistic It puts you in kind of her state of mind and shows you that as the attack was escalating, how she was trying to focus in on, you know, remembering details and just surviving and trying to analyze what was going on. So I think the details really helped you understand, you know, not just like I was attacked and during it, I was trying to do this, this and this. It was like with each element of the attack, she had to like use it to analyze how she was going to make it through. Yeah, and something the book really pointed out when speaking about Jennifer's experience with this whole event, she really was handed a bad card by everyone around her. They sent her a bill for her incompleted rape kit, which is just insane. Like, she, you know, she shouldn't get billed for that. No, one should get billed for a rape kit. And side note, one of my 
like hot button issues is how many rape kits are like not even tested. So oh, we're yeah. charging women for rape kits and then just putting them on a shelf somewhere and like, oh, maybe it'll get tested. Maybe it won't. Yeah. Like take it right now and go test it. Yeah. I know in North Carolina, there's like 10,000 rape kits untested. Yeah. They also um, made a really big point about the way her family and her boyfriend treated her after the attack. And it just shows like a huge problem with the way that victims are treated whenever they are sexually assaulted or raped. They brought up a lot of points that dealt with the ignorance of other people and the judgment that they cast on someone who's a victim of rape and all the little things that you might not even think of that people have to go through, which, you know, people always say, well, why didn't they come forward? Well, these are the reasons why, because if you read this book, you see how people interact with her afterwards. Like either she's frail or she asked for it or, you know, she didn't fight enough, she didn't fight enough. Yeah. Like all of these different things. And they're easier to say in your head, you know, like you're like, oh, well, you hear that all the time, like that, you know, and you know, it's wrong that people say that. But when you read her stuff in the book, you really are put in her shoes and see what it's like for someone to be interacting in that kind of situation with another person who's been through it. Yeah, because all you want when you've been like violated in that way is for the people that are supposed to care about you to like be there and support you and to even have them ridicule her and make awful comments and just kind of like turn away like it was an inconvenience and things like that is just like adds to the trauma that she went through and definitely made me want to throw hands with her boyfriend at that time because oh my gosh when he was like saying that stuff and she was like the relationship like basically ended there but we just kind of went on pretending for a few more months I was like oh I would have jumped across that table yeah karate kicked in the neck (laughs) yeah just to tell someone oh you didn't fight enough so like you were asking for it or like you didn't do enough to prevent your attack like she was asleep in her own bed there's just like no right way to do it you know some women fight back and they survive some women fight back and they don't some women don't fight back and just have to survive that way like whatever you do to survive is the right way to survive Like people always, you know, talk about, oh, she was wearing, you know, too short of a skirt or she was drinking or she was walking here alone at night and judging them for it. But then it's like they also judge Jennifer and she was just innocently sleeping in her apartment alone. Like you can't get less, you know, quote unquote, asking for it than that. And she still faced all of this. So that really just shows that the treatment of victims is something people really need to think about. Just like the way that you interact with people, especially people you care about, like just think about what you're going to say before you say it and try to be empathetic and compassionate to victims. When Cotton was addressed about the situation because she picked him out of the line, he tried to come up with an alibi and he was confused about his days. So then it appeared to the court like he was changing his alibi which as we know from an outside perspective when someone changes their alibis that's usually not a really good sign that's something that you can kind of point at and be like oh that's that's a little fishy you know so the fact that he was confusing his days didn't settle well for him basically the alibi mistake was taken as a lie and there was this little bit of rubber that somewhat matched cotton shoes and Cotton somehow owned this flashlight that was similar to the one that the rapist had. And it was all like kind of the same. So they were like, oh, sure, it works because his alibi is not really lining up. And this was pretty much all they had in terms of evidence other than the eyewitness statement that Jennifer Thompson had said in the court. Yeah. So they basically took her statement and then tried to pile some extra things on top of it. But there was no like physical evidence that was really all that strong. There was another man named Bobby Leon Poole. He was a convicted rapist, and he actually did commit those crimes. And Cotton thought about killing Poole a few times. He even made a weapon to do it because he was just absolutely sure that Bobby Poole was the one who actually raped Jennifer Thompson and that he was here serving Poole's time. When they would see him in prison... Even the guards would get Bobby and Cotton mixed up. And we have a picture on our website that has a photo of each of them next to each other. And they are so identical. Honestly, they could be brothers or even like twins. It's crazy. So it's no wonder that because he was a convicted rapist, he had talked to some other people in the prison about how he did rape Jennifer Thompson. And he also looked so much like caught in that it's kind of a given that Bobby Poole would be considered someone that was a perpetrator by Cotton. 
Yeah, I can't imagine. Like, even the first time that he saw him in prison, that was, like, his first thought was, like, he must have done it. Like, he's from the same area. He's a rapist. He's, like, talked about it to other inmates and all this stuff. So I know, I'd be like, why am I even here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that has to be so frustrating. Even if they didn't look alike. Like, even just knowing that you're in the same room as someone who committed a crime that you're in prison for. Like, that's just, like, one of the examples of cotton like even though he had like planned on killing him and stuff and then talked to his dad and was like i gotta just let it go like there's nothing i can do about it and that just shows the strength that he had and that's just like one of many examples of him just choosing the kind of peaceful path even though he was wronged so much and he had to literally sit in prison with the guy he knew had done it and just live with that They found some blood at the scene. It didn't match Cotton, but it didn't rule out Poole. And he also, you know, resembled the drawings and the physical description as well as as his previous offenses being the same as Cotton that he was being charged with. And he even had the same gloves that were mentioned that the attacker had been wearing. But Poole denied everything in court. He seemed unbothered and kind of appalled that he would even get addressed about this case. However... It was noted that he did grin while on stand. It was also noticed that one of the girls flinched. So it was thought that the guy who was the rapist had this really creepy grin on his face. And when one of the girls flinched, Cotton believed this was the creepy grin mentioned by the victim. And that when Poole did that on the stand, it kind of like maybe made the connection in her head like that looked just like the guy who raped me. Another inmate in the prison, Dennis Bass, said that Poole confessed to him that he had done this crime but it was wasn't really like an official statement or anything that they could take because they were just so sure that Ronald Cotton had done it so they weren't really looking for ways out of that I guess yeah and obviously like when people are in prison they'll try to come forward with information just to get their sentence shortened or to be on good terms so if they really thought that they had the guy then they were like why am I gonna listen to you yeah Cotton ended up being found guilty, and when he was asked if he wanted to say anything, he made this statement about how he was innocent, and he'd never seen Jennifer Thompson before, and then he sang this song, and it was such, like, a deep, like, meaningful moment, and what that was one interesting thing about the book is Jennifer, obviously, you know, she thought this man had raped her, so she was, like, sitting in the courtroom, like, just seething, very mad, and full of hate for this man that had that she thought had done this to her so him singing like felt offensive to her in that moment but then years and years later when they're friends and like things are happening she kind of thinks back on that moment and is like she's done a full 180 basically in how she feels about him but that moment in the courtroom was like such a something that like really stuck with her Cotton ended up having to go back to trial for a second time, and he actually left that trial with more time than he had gone with, which usually, you know, you go back to trial and sentences are reduced, but he actually was charged with a second rape of another woman this time who originally, like, didn't want to come forward, but did end up coming forward and identifying him. So he kind of had to go away from that second trial, like, in a worse spot than he was in the beginning, which obviously was very disheartening for him this kind of led to one of my favorite parts of the book was it just kind of showed the humanity and the kindness of ronald cotton and there was this cat that would just come up to the prison and he kind of took it in as his own and he would feed it and made a bed for it and called it judy and everyone knew that judy was his cat and he loved Judy. And then the other inmates would also pay him to draw flowers on the envelopes that they would send out and the letters since he was so good at drawing flowers. And it just kind of makes you feel a lot more connected to Ronald Cotton. You think when you're in prison, everyone's so tough and like won't show their sensitive side or, you know, this and that. And obviously it is true. They have to make a place for themselves or else they'll get hurt or injured or bullied or you know pick your pick your thing it's all of them but it also shows that like these guys were literally paying him to draw flowers on their letters you know and the fact that he took in this cat that he loved and obviously if you read the book you know that it didn't end well for the cat sadly because some other inmates are just cruel but he got to enjoy this time with that cat for a long long while the oj simpson case 
kind of came at the time that DNA was starting to be used more consistently in criminal investigations. And Cotton got the opportunity to possibly get the DNA tested in his case. And the motion passed for that to happen. And that was really a big turning point in his journey. They found DNA that matched Jennifer and her boyfriend, but the other DNA did not belong to Cotton. This information was obviously like groundbreaking for his case. And they went to the wardens and then kind of all of a sudden things started moving and Ronald was being released because Bobby Poole admitted to committing both of the rapes that Ronald Cotton had been accused of and the DNA ended up matching him and it was like a done deal and suddenly he was out. Yeah, it took Bobby Poole five hours to finally confess about it because they were like, you know, the DNA matches, you know, everyone's pointing towards you, Cotton pointed towards you, this guy said it was you, you said you committed to it, you know, he was like, you tell us which officers are running drugs (laughs) and we'll just create a little agreement here. (laughs) Ronald spent almost 11 years in prison, all told. It was like a little bit over 10 and a half And he was suddenly free and had to figure out how to kind of assimilate back into society. And that was a cool part of the book, too, because he talked about kind of his experience just like suddenly being free and how like the sky seemed so big and just there was all these opportunities and things like suddenly opened to him that he had probably figured that he wouldn't see again. Yeah, I love all of the sentiments that happened too whenever Ronald was getting de- getting released. It just seemed like really touching. Everyone was really happy for him and like proud for him. And he was officially cleared by the governor of North Carolina on or in, sorry, July 1995. And he was only to be giving given $5,000 for the 10 and a half years that he spent in prison, which, you know, nowadays it's like you know, we talked about Juan Rivera. I think he got like, like millions. Yeah. For however long he was in there, 20 years, I think. Yeah. Something like that. So it's definitely a little bit changed now, but his lawyers said that they didn't want a dime of anything that they just wanted him to go out and live his life and be free and do good in the world and be like the awesome person that he is. Yeah. His lawyers were really amazing people. They really, how often do we get to say that? Yeah, honestly, <laughs> they like took this case to heart and really like ran with it where, I mean, we've talked about so many lawyers that kind of like half-ass it. They don't really care. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and just kind of whatever. But they were in it with their whole heart, which is incredible. And I think it was mentioned that Ronald Cotton was the first person in North Carolina to be cleared by DNA. So it was like kind of you know wrongful convictions and innocent projects and all that stuff wasn't really a thing at that point as much so I think that's why they kind of were like here's a little bit of money go away (laughs) like kind of thing and so it's pretty cool that things have changed so much yeah it is really awesome and I love the ending of the story because it was just you know Jennifer was really moved to meet Ronald in person and whenever they met they were able to dissolve a lot of the negative feelings that they had well pretty much just Jennifer um Ronald was very you know he understood that Jennifer went through something traumatic and that she made a mistake um but their families were able to come together and it really just led to Jennifer even being able to forgive Poole and just let go of her anger for the whole situation And she wrote a letter to help with the bill to get Cotton more money. And he eventually received over $109,000. It was supposed to be, I think, $10,000 for every year he served. But they were like, you didn't actually serve 11 years. You served like 10 and a half. So like... Boy, if I was behind the sale, then you go and pay me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it was really cool. It was like... Because Jennifer was so angry at Cotton. And then when she realized that he was innocent, then she felt like shame and she felt fear like he was going to come after her and things like that so she had so many huge emotions towards him and then by that time Ronald had pretty much let go of everything but his wife was very angry like his family was still very angry and so I think them meeting really helped heal a lot of people and it was really cool to 
kind of hear the story of their friendship progressing. It was like they met and then they would talk a little bit here and there about speaking engagements. And then they were calling each other like, how you doing? And then eventually it was like, oh, okay, bye. I love you like kind of thing. And just watching each other's kids grow up. And so it was a very cool friendship to develop. And I think it was funny when they were sitting in like a restaurant or something and she was like, like they would think it's so crazy if they knew like who we actually were to each yeah. other, you know? Yeah. And it's really cool too. What Jennifer does now, she started learning, learning a lot more about investigative errors and the way that people tamper with witness testimonies and how it's not just an intentional thing, but it's just bad standards. And it really helped her forgive herself because that was something she struggled with a lot in the book was like, she put this man behind bars because she, thought it was him so she was able to really forgive herself and learn more about memory and eyewitnesses and she's now prompts people to better educate themselves and educate the police and put in order better practices to improve the policies and structures that we have and that's one thing that stuck with me like I've known about this story for a long time um, before I even read this book and I've heard Jennifer speak about it and Jennifer and Ron will go around to like conferences and police departments and try to share like research and evidence evidence based like techniques and stuff and I remember Jennifer saying that like a lot of the police departments just won't even hear them out or will just like be like yeah okay whatever and like not even care which is so frustrating but it's one of those things we talk about all the time is like they're only as good as their standards, like as the techniques that they use to investigate. And so when we're using things as tenuous as eyewitness testimony, it's just bad practice. And that's just how so many people are innocently in prison. Yeah. I know we've talked a little bit about our opinions throughout the kind of gist of the book, but we're going to really dive into those now. And as we know, I always talk about the structure of a book. To me, the way that the book is formatted is just as por- just as important as the story itself. If you have an amazing story and you don't format your book properly, it's going to suck. If you have a great format, but your story sucks, then it's going to suck. You know, so it's like very important to have both. And I just loved the structure of this book going back and forth between the perspectives of the wrongfully accused and the victim, because it really made you see different perspectives that maybe you hadn't thought of. Obviously, when we read into these cases, it's a lot of fact, 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 this happened, this happened. And sometimes you get kind of numb to the fact that it's really happening. Like we obviously all know that these people are really going through it. That's why we try not to joke about victims or, you know, crime that has happened but in this situation it really makes you step into the story with them and think about things that they experience that you don't even consider on a daily basis yeah and it shows you that there's multiple sides to every story and a lot of times they're just as valid you know from one perspective as another and so many times with true crime like we do it and like most true crime podcasts do it from one perspective so it's like this is what happened to the victim this is their feelings this is everything about that or like this is what happened to a wrongfully convicted person and you only really get their side their emotions like what they went through but to see the stories like intertwine I think is a really unique aspect to this book and I think we both did audiobook for this one right Mm -hmm. and I thought the way that they did the audiobook was really good having um different voices for Jennifer and Ronald's thought was really good I always like that in audiobooks when there's like different people it helps me like rather than them just changing their accent or something yeah (laughs) sometimes like it's a little hokey but in this case I think the narrators were perfect the writing was really good Mm -hmm. it flowed well and it told the story really well a plus plus yes five out of five it was also super interesting to see the progression of how things went wrong in the investigation and it's one of those cases like you know i will gripe on wrongful convictions and bad practices in police departments all day long but i think in this case for the most part not entirely but for the most part it really wasn't anyone being malicious or anyone like purposefully manipulating things it was just good intentions and a lack of training basically there were like a couple of questionable people like the cop that was making comments about it oh he was a rapist because he dated white women or whatever like that and that one prosecutor who um 
when uh, they were standing at line somewhere like in a restaurant or something and or it was like a convenience store and um the prosecutor came in and the guy made him show his ID and he was like, I come in here all the time to buy stuff. And the guy was like, well, all I know about you is like, you don't, you're not like good enough to even like put the right person in prison or something like that. And then he got mad and left. So like that guy caught and said that he never apologized to him, never like heard from him, nothing. So pride can do some bad things. Yeah. And that's definitely a takeaway from this is like, we've seen those cases where, people actively kind of work against justice like Adnan's case Stephen Avery Juan Rivera like those people involved in those cases like know they're doing the wrong thing and do it anyway but in this case I really think that most of them thought that they were doing good thought that they were helping Jennifer thought that they were getting justice and it's a good thing to remember that sometimes it's really like no one person's fault or no one person's like negative intentions but it's just the culmination of training that's just not psychology based and not evidence based and it becomes standard practice but it's not effective i think another message that everyone can kind of take away from this book is like the way that jennifer like i said she had so many strong like negative emotions towards towards the defense and you know like lots of people involved in this case She had all of these like negative emotions just building up for years and she was just harboring all this hate. When she actually met each of these people, she found that they were kind and just like normal people, not the monsters that she had made them in her head. So I think that's an important thing to remember is the way we perceive people or the way that we like paint them in our heads isn't always how they are in reality. And just taking a step back from like the anger and the hatred can open up a lot of doors if you just kind of give people the benefit of the the doubt sometimes. I think the part about Jennifer hating Phil Mosley and then seeing him in line at McDonald's or wherever and him just being kind to her, she said that was kind of a turning point for her. And I think that was the beginning of her kind of letting go and finding the strength to actually face Ronald Cotton and all of that. So I think that was something that everyone kind of needs to hear from time to time. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that you can have differences of opinions and still be able to sit down and have a conversation and like, you know, appreciate them as a human being, but not necessarily agree with what they've done or do, you know? Yeah, people aren't always the monsters that we paint them to be. And Jennifer kind of had that reminder again when she started working with that organization, um, SCAN, I think it was called, and started working with kind of training parents, better ways to parent and you know, less like violent or harsh ways of parenting. She said she realized, you know, each of these people, even though they were doing awful things, like they had whole lives of negative things happening to them too. It was like a cycle and she was able to have more compassion for these people, you know, even though she still knew what they were doing was wrong and it still, you know, needs to be fixed and stuff. She saw them as more human and less just like bad. I think it was important that they laid out the things that kind of went wrong in the investigation. Like even just tiny little things like telling Jennifer good job after picking the photo or just the way that they kind of encouraged her or congratulated her sort of. And that just solidified Cotton as the person in her memory and and not um, Bobby Poole. If you know, kind of like, if you've ever taken like a basic psychology course, you know with memory, every time you remember a memory, you're not remembering, there's like the primary memory, and then each time you remember it, it's like a little bit further and a little bit further. So many studies have shown that it's really easy to kind of input details into people's memories and have that, have them be- Inception. (laughs) Yeah, and have them be just like completely sure that things happen this certain way it's very easy to to manipulate memory and it was like a cycle because she felt very confident in her ability to id him and so the cops congratulated her but then also they took her confidence as confidence themselves that they were doing the right thing and like on the right path so it was like kind of a self-fulfilling cycle where they were both feeding confidence into each other Yeah, and this is one of those rare events where people actually admitted that they were wrong, like they did something wrong and that, you know, this is something they can take the hit for and work on to be better in the future. Yeah, the cops and the defense attorneys and the prosecutors all, for the most part, 
basically were like, okay, we messed up here and we need to fix it, which <clears throat> Lake County could take note of. But like I said before, Jennifer and Ronald go around and try to spread this education and kind of advocate for reform in these techniques. And a lot of police departments won't even listen to them. And I think that's when it comes in. Like if you just don't know better, then you can still do something wrong, but it's not like with malicious intent. But if someone tells you that like a better way of doing it or that the way you're doing it is act- actively harmful and you choose not to fix it, that's where it starts to become more of a conscious choice. Overall, for a nonfiction book, I would give it a five out of five. That's high for me. That's really high for that me. Is, I'm a tough praise. critic. <laughs> <laughs> but I do I would give the same thing for like the Iceman and I see them both as being like equally as good nonfiction books in my mind. Yeah, I agree. This was one of my favorite books that we've done for book club. It's been I've literally had it in my queue for so long to read, so I'm glad I finally got to it. And I just love the story. I think it's an amazing story about forgiveness, letting go, persevering through horrible things and just the goodness of people and again it's a good reminder that the way you perceive people is not always the way that they are and sometimes having some grace and just a different perspective can really change your life and then on the other side there's also a lot of good information about how wrongful convictions come to be and how we can do better and that we still have a long way to go in ending these like shaky evidence and junk science kind of things that are so prevalent in police work. Yeah, I think this story did a really good job about bringing different points to surface that were needing to be talked about. Yeah. Another thing I really liked about this book was just kind of how strange life can be. And Jennifer kind of talked about that when she was like sitting in the car um, towards the end of the book, like after she had been friends with Ronald Cotton for a long time, you know, she was sitting in the car with him and her daughter and his wife and his daughter. And they were just like singing to songs on the radio. And, it, and she was thinking like about who she was when she was in that courtroom, just like hating this man and just like wishing that he was dead. And if you had told her at that point that, you know, in 10, 15 years or whatever, she would be sitting in a car, like singing along with the radio with him and his kid and, you know, they would be friends, like more than friends, like basically family family at this point. Like she just never would have believed it. So it's just an interesting thing. If you like think back on your life and the weird twists and turns that life takes and how you can end up somewhere that you just never even considered any, any way possible. Preach. That just makes me think about that. You know, we're all just on a rock. Yeah. (laughs) Just floating through space. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But Just open yourself to the possibilities. You never know. You never know what can happen. Wise words from our beloved Brit. (laughs) (laughs) We hope you guys enjoyed this book just as much as we did. That pretty much wraps up we have to say about it. Um, Jumping into our book for next month. It'll come out on June 4th. We're very excited about it. It's another from our lovely Lucy. Lucy Foley. We're going to be reading The Guest List. This is one of like Reese Witherspoon's book club books too. Just kind of like it was with um, Where the Crawdads Sing, which we like are obsessed with that book. So we're very excited to read this. And the summary says The Bride, The Plus One, The Best Man, The Wedding Planner, The Bridesmaid, The Body. On an island off the coast of Ireland, Mm -hmm. (laughs) guests gather to celebrate two people joining their lives together as one in holy matrimony. The groom, handsome and charming, a rising television star. The bride, smart and ambitious, a magazine publisher. It's a wedding for a magazine or for a celebrity. The designer dress, the remote location, the looks, party favors, the boutique whiskey, the cell phone service may be spotty and the waves may be rough, but every detail has been expertly planned and will be expertly executed. But perfection is for plans, and people are all too human. As the champagne is popped and the festivities begin, resentments and petty jealousies begin to mingle with the reminiscences Oh, God, I hate that word. I'm just going to keep going. And well wishes. The groomsmen begin the drinking game from their school days. The bridesmaid not so accidentally ruins her dress. And the bride's 
oldest male friend gives an uncomfortably caring toast. And then someone turns up dead. Who didn't wish the happy couple well? And perhaps more important, why? <laughs> dun, bum, dun, bum. Dun. <laughs> Ooh, we just harmonized. <laughs> Sign us up for a record label. <laughs> But we're pretty excited about it. We really liked the other Lucy Foley book, The Hunting Party, that we read. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, I remember us saying that that was like her first one. And so she still had some growth to do. This is her growth. We're excited to read it because we saw a lot of potential with her. And she knew, like, she even mentioned that she was really looking forward to, like, exploring more of it and getting more into this mystery, murder mystery writing. So we're really excited to go on the journey with her. She is someone we like. Yes. Make sure you pick that up, audiobook or paper book if you must. I know. We get the audiobook, audiobook with our script thing, but I really want to read it, read it, <laughs> but I might audiobook it. I don't know. See if it's at the library. Ooh. We got library cards. Yes, we're fancy now. We were going way too expensive on things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now we got library cards. I'll have to check it out, but then I only have two weeks to read it. Well, then I can renew it, but then I have to go to my re- way to renew it or I have to pay for Probably it. Probably just do it online. Oh, technology <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, go ahead and get your book. We've got a link on our website if you want to go through there. Otherwise, you just go to Google, type it in Google, and it'll pop up on Amazon or whatever your bookstore you like. So be sure to be reading that and we will see you on Monday with our next episode. Thank you guys for diving back into the abyss with us after a month of hiatus, and we can't wait to keep it going with you guys. Bye.